Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes. Illustrated by Land Ward and published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. So we just finished uh, the last section in Chapter 7. And Johnny had stopped by the lights uh, to go see Scylla. And she wasn't available because they're getting ready for a, a ball, a big dance. And Miss Lavinia is like the center of attention. All these British soldiers are there. And it's going to be a masquerade ball. So she's going to be dressed up. It's like kind of a deck of cards. Like she'll be the queen of spades. And then all these, these men who are wooing her are going to be like the knave or the jack, you know, or, or like the king or um, an ace or whatever. Uh, the Joker. <laughs> Hopefully you don't want the Joker. I think the Joker is supposed to be um, Isana because she's acting ridiculous and Johnny actually slaps her to like get her to come to her senses, um, which is what they used to do in those days. And everybody's laughing when she, Isana falls over and they just think it's so hilarious, but Johnny thinks it's all very inappropriate. And so Miss Lavinia tells him to leave and go back to the, quote, gutter where he came from and um, sends Scylla up to her room. Uh, and then Johnny finds out that Mrs. Bessie, who is the cook and housekeeper, is actually, she says, if they had a Daughters of Liberty, I'd be one. You ask Sam Adams about me. I've been helping him secretly for years. So she has the inside scoop on what's going on at the lights. And then she tells Johnny, and basically he knows he can trust her. So, chapter 8, A World to Come. Let's get started. Look at this great picture. It was by chance Johnny saw the lights, ruby coach, trundling slowly down Orange Street, heading for Milton, and a little country air. Because remember, they just said, Mrs. Bessie said, they're going to head out to Milton uh, to... Uh, get some fresh air and have, you know, stretch a little bit. The bright sun glittered on the gold eye rising on the coach door on the black sheen of the strong horses. He half wanted to stop the coach. Don't you go to Milton, Miss Light. They are lying in wait for you out there. He could not bear to think of her tossed about by rough men, ridden on a rail. That means like thrown out or forced out in your carriage. He could see her profile through the window. Scylla sat facing her. Isana, as befitted her higher station in the household, sat next to Miss Light. Only Isana was staring about, observing the lower classes milling about in the street. She looked straight at Johnny, and he at her. Neither gave any sign of recognition. It was not by chance Johnny next saw that ruby coach. Late in August, Word was spread through Boston that Merchant Light had got it, or was going to get it, out in Milton. <clears throat> if driven from their country house, there was but one safe refuge for them, behind the British lines in Boston. <clears throat> Toward evening, Johnny began to hang about the gate. The farm carts carrying food and fuel to Boston were still coming in over the mud flats, connecting the town with the mainland. These, the British guard at the gate, nearly 200 men were kept stationed there night and day, let pass, so they let the food carts come in. But when night really fell, the gates were closed and most of the soldiers returned to the barracks. There were a few sentries on duty and a handful of men with a corporal in the guardhouse. Hold on, need this to focus. There we go. Johnny settled down to wait. He had been dozing, but woke quickly, hearing the sentries yell and the corporal commanding the gates to be opened. Then, coming closer, through the still summer night, the clatter of hoofs, the rumble of a coach, was a sickening, hair-raising howl, the howling of a human wolf pack. Okay, that means a bunch of humans acting like wolves. The corporal had not had time to get his tunic on, but he recognized the situation. Another of his majesty's loyal supporters fleeing to Boston with the mob at its heels. Torches only, he was crying to his men. No muskets, death to any man who fires. 
the unarmed soldiers ran out to meet the coach with great flaring torches in their hands. The mob already had stopped and was drifting back from whence it came. Through the canopy of shaking orange light and through the smell of burning pitch, pitch black horses. <laughs> ah, the lights, the lights. <laughs> pitch black horses whitened with lather and dragging a heavy ruby coach. Okay, this is the lights, the heavy ruby coach. Slowly crawled to safety of to the safety of the gates. The gates shut behind them. The coach seemed disabled. The horses were almost spent, like frothy. They've been running the entire distance. A torch flared up onto the coachman's face. It was twisted with fear. Mr. Light, yourself, sir, the young corporal was saying as he opened the door of the coach. Let me assist you, sir. You've lost a wheel off your coach. Please to come into the guardhouse while you wait for another vehicle. Mr. Light, helped by the corporal, but even more by Miss Lavinia, did crawl from the coach. He tried to smile, but his lips drew back from long yellow teeth. Johnny had seen the identical expression on the face of a dead woodchuck. He was a desperately sick man. Lavinia's face showed no fear, only concern over her father's condition. Now she was telling the corporal that a doctor must be fetched, and she wanted Dr. Warren. I know he's a rebel, but do get him for me. He's the best doctor we have in town, and Papa, Papa must have the best. Her father safely inside the guardhouse, Miss Lavinia came into the street a moment, gazing blankly at the disabled coach and at the men carrying from it into the guardhouse such of their most precious possessions as they had had time to rescue from Milton. For the first time, Johnny saw Scylla. She had been sitting on the box with the coachman. Now she went to Miss Light. Somehow, she said, the silver got left behind. The silver? Miss Light did not seem to be able to take in anything but her father's sickness. You told me to pack it up, but just as I had begun, we heard the mob coming, and then Mr. Light had a fit. Oh, yes, I remember. All that silver. Well, <laughs> she was standing there in the street, watching for the sight of Dr. Warren's chaise. Isana, very good and quiet, was snuggled close to her, her hand in that of her patroness. Oh, never mind, child, she said with absent-minded kindness. At least we're all safe, and if only Papa is well, and... I'm going back to Milton, miss, to get that silver before the riffraff steal it. Most like they have it already. Dr. Warren's chaise was drawing up beside the guardhouse. He was getting out. Miss Lavinia had no more thought of her silver. Johnny went up to Scylla. Look, Syl, he said, I'm here. Oh, it was so mixed up at the end. The girl seemed to be trying to explain her error more to herself than to Johnny. Mr. Light turned purple and fell. The mob was getting closer. It came earlier than Mrs. Bessie warned us. Mrs. Bessie? Yes, she found out some way in the village. Johnny liked the old woman all the better that in the end she had been unable to see a considerate master whom she had served for 30 years a young woman whom she had taken care of since she was a baby, humiliated, tossed about, torn by a mob. Sam Adams might respect her the less for this weakness. Johnny respected her the more. Johnny, I've got to get back to Milton. I'm going to save that silver. It was my fault. But Miss Lavinia didn't seem to care. She didn't scold you. If she had, I wouldn't go. She thinks it has been stolen already. No, after smashing the gates and some windows, the mob left the house to chase us. We didn't dare leave by the front drive. We started out through the haying fields, but they heard us and caught up, and we were getting away all right until just on the neck a wheel came off the coach. It was terrible. I've got to go back, though, and now. I'll go with you. But looks like we'll need a horse and chaise. 
It's seven miles. Dr. Warren was standing on the guardhouse steps, telling Miss Light that her father must be allowed to finish the night out on the bed the soldiers had made up for him. Finish the night out, so he's got to stay put. He was not to be moved, and never again must he be so upset over anything. From now on, as long as he lived, as she loved him, he was never to be angered or worried. The handsome girl was nodding, promising these impossible things. She went back to her father, still clutching Isana by the hand, and Johnny went to the doctor. Obviously, Dr. Warren did not want to lend his horse and chaise. He did not care what happened to the light silver, but he was a generous man. He let Johnny have his rig and also wrote him a pass which would prevent any molestation from the Whig mobs and told Scylla to get a similar pass from the British soldiers. Then they would be safe from either side. So, at last, the gates once more swung slowly, heavily in. Beyond was darkness and a dreary waste of land and sea. The doctor's little rabbit-eared mare flung herself forward. It would not take such a fast pacer long to get to Milton. And that's the end of section one and the end of our video. Click subscribe and we'll see you on the next one.